Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Stories That Inspire Us podcast. My name is Janice Malillo, and I am your host today. Just to let everyone know, I am also simulcasting this broadcast through the Wisdom Audio app. Today, I am very humbled, very amazed to be here with my amazing guest. Her story will not only inspire you, and all I will have to say is you may need the tissue, so just get them ready. But I, her purpose, her main purpose in doing this is to get her story out to inspire others. So without further ado, I want to welcome to the Stories podcast, Daisy Page. Welcome. I'm so excited to have you here. Hi, Janice. Thank you so much for having me. It's us an honor to be here today with you. Oh, thank you. It's an honor for me to be in your presence. And for those of us um, who are going to be listening to the audio, Daisy is um, right behind her, <coughs> excuse me, is a plaque of her book. So I want, kind of want to start there. And her book is entitled Unexpected Moments. And the foreword for this book was actually written by Kurt Cameron. Daisy, I have so many questions that I want to ask you, but I want to back it up a little bit and start with the moment you decided to write, uh, to write your book, which will lead us into what is happening, what has happened to you. Okay. Well, I didn't know I was going to write a book. I was diagnosed with a terminal um, rare condition. And God came to me in this really brilliant, bright light vision. I saw hands come through like they were praying and arms up and wide and said, my child, your time is near. But first, you must tell your story from the beginning. And I was like, how am I going to do that? He goes, you know, you'll find a way. Well, then I met Kurt Cameron and I shared that story with him. And he's the one who said, he thinks I should write a book. And I was like, me? Write a book? <laughs> I wrote a poem my whole life. That's all I've ever written. He said, write it. Write your story down. Keep me updated. Send me um, the manuscript when you're finished. I did that. And he sent me back a forward. And I'm had, three months later, I had my book published. Wow. And you obviously worked very hard on that. And we're going to get into more of the book in just a second. Now, from our pre-podcast chat and from reading your book thus far, which is amazing, you faced, I want to call them challenges, but they really were the kind of challenges that nobody in their lives should ever go through. Can you give us a little background on some of the traumatic events that have occurred, which led you to ultimately write this book? Sure. Well, um, when I was eight years old, I became a Christian and uh, started going to church. You know, I was already going to church every Sunday morning and night and Wednesday night and uh, participating in state Bible drills and going to church camp every summer. Um, at nine years old, I started being molested by my brother that lasted for four and a half years. And when I was 14, I was raped and also drugged by another guy that had asked me, you know, along with about nine other girls out. When we all turned him down, he laced us with LSD and PCP. So, um. I was having, we were all having these spells. I mean, if you sit in class and one of us will just fall out, you know, and it was happening all over the school. So it took a couple months, but the police finally figured it out because we all went to the school store and then we found out this guy had asked us all out. We all turned him down. And so they did a, a test, a spinal test and found LSD and PCP in high levels in my system. And, um, they went to the drug bust on him, and unfortunately, he pulled a gun on a police officer and was shot and killed during that raid. 
Oh my goodness. And it was after that I tried to take my life. And uh, I was just like, God, you know, why is this happening to me? Here I am, I'm being a devoted Christian. I have Bible study and devotionals in every day. Um, I'm participating in Bible drills. I know the Bible from front to back. I'm really tr trying hard to be a faithful Christian to you. I just can't understand why this is happening to me. So, you know, I went into a deep, dark depression and tried to take my life. And uh, oh. that is, yeah, that is pretty heavy for anyone to go through. And I'm thinking of, when all of this is transpiring, when you found out, for instance, that it was someone, that this wasn't just happening to you, but it was happening to others in such a, a violent type of way, I can't even fathom what that was like. And then to get to that point where you wanted to take your life. Well, and two, well, before they could find out what's going on, you know, um, people were calling us fakers, you know, like, how can we be fake? And there's none of us, and we're doing the same thing. We're not even in, around each other. We're not knowing what, you, what each other's doing. Um, and they couldn't figure out what was going on. And when they did find the drugs, you know, my first thing my dad did was look at me like, why are you doing drugs? And I'm like, Daddy, I have not touched a drug in my whole life. I would never do that. You know, and then the, the doctor said, I believe her. You know, these levels are too high. No one would no one would do this amount of PCP and LSD at her age. She's only 14 years old. So. so I assume that through this person, they were, how were they presenting it? Was it through food? Was it through... It was through like gum and candy and I was, some of us were smoking cigarettes and so, you know, back then you could buy a pack of cigarettes no matter how old you were. So they found, they would take packs of cigarettes that were ours and there would be little pinholes all throughout the cigarette packages where they were injecting it into them. Wow. Wow. And the Very back... Scary. Yeah, very scary. Very scary for for all of you. I mean, Such I can a remember a time that I was in the marching band out on the football field during during this uh, these spells, and and we did like a right face, and I looked back and I saw the band behind me, and it was like an army with weapons coming after me. So I just took off running off the football field in the middle of the halftime show, mind you and just ran through the football par field parking lot and across the street into some bushes and was hiding. And my dad was a police officer, so he got called out to this, um, this lady called and said, there's a somebody in my bushes with a, something shiny. Mm -hmm. And it was me with my baritone hiding in her, her bushes. When my dad realized it was me, he was, he was like, uh, what, what are you doing here? I'm like, they were chasing me. They were going to kill me. So, you know, he... He immediately took me to the hospital that night. Oh, my goodness. Now, I know that uh, in reference to your parents, you lost your mom at a very early age, and that left um, a very deep hole in your heart because there's nothing like a mom's love. That's true. I, I thought my, my stepmother was my real mother until I was a little over eight years old. Um, and I uh, was at my real mom's mother's house and I saw this picture of this beautiful woman on the wall and I asked her, you know, who's that woman in the picture? She just, she just left the room. And a few minutes later, my mom and dad pull up and my mom said on, outside on the car hood, my father came in and he said, you know, I need to tell you something. He sat down and he said that your mom's gone to heaven to be with the angels. And I looked out and I saw her sitting on the hood of the car and I just took off running out of the house and went, grabbed her by her legs and said, Mom, would you please go back in the house? They, they said, you're dead. Go in there and tell them that you're not dead. So she took me by my hand and we went to the house and 
That's when my father told me that the woman there in your picture is the one that gave birth to you. She died when you were a baby. And Judy's not your real mom, or Jolie's not your real mom. She's, she's your stepmother. How did that, with your relationship with your stepmom, go from there? Was there any kind of, I don't want to say resentment, but was there any issues with that relationship after you found out the truth about that? There was, I guess I had a little resentment. I felt that I had been lied to because previously to that story, um, I was in the car, we were, we, were, we were on our way home from somewhere and I just asked from the back seat, was I adopted? Because I had this feeling that something wasn't right. And they said, no, you weren't adopted. So I, I felt like I'd been lied to, you know, the life I knew was not the truth. And I would tell her, you're not my real mom. You, know, can, you, know, you can't tell me what to do sometimes, things like that. Um, so yeah, that was a little different. It was kind of a life-changing a moment, you know, a reality shock, so to speak. <laughs> Uh, with, without a doubt, I can't even imagine, you know, being at a very young and impressionable age like that and being at your grandmother's house with seeing a picture of this beautiful lady and then to come to find out that she is my mom. Is your mom. Yeah. And my grandmother was a lot older. I mean, I had a lot of grandparents. So. I just thought she was like a great grandma because I called her grandmother. So, you know, I didn't know at a young age that she just had, had my mom in her 40s. So she, she was older. So your mom, does she have any siblings? Yes. She had a sister and two brothers. Wow. She was Did the you youngest. Know? She was a lot younger than them. Okay. Now, did you have any relation, family relationships with them, you know, being at your grandmother's house? Yes, actually. Um, my stepmother and my father would take us over there for Christmas and Easter and let us, you know, have some family time with them as well. Um, so that was nice. Even when my father had to work, my stepmom would take us over there. So wow. and they promised my grandmother, they said when my, my mom died, and they got married that they wouldn't that wouldn't change for the, that part of the family that they would keep them involved and they did when and, i got and that's old, a beautiful thing yeah yeah when i got older i'd go over there still and you know spend the night by myself and things like that so wow now going forward as a teenager and then this horrible event happens to you as you mentioned, um, molested by your brother for four and a half years at the age of 14 um, with the LSD and the PCP and then being raped. But the traumatic things didn't stop there. No. And they continued. Can you tell us the story of your dad? Because I know that obviously your dad is a was a big part of your life. Tell us about your dad. Okay. First of all, I want to back up a little bit and say that you know my brother, my brother after my, I found out about my mother, and after he had molested me a couple of times, he told me you know it was my fault that my mother had died. If I'd have never been born that she would be still be alive and he'd still have his mom. And that's why he's mean to me and that he was gonna to continue to be mean to me because of that. So that was very uh, emotionally abusive to me, you know, making me think as a baby that I was responsible for my mother's death. Um, but going, what happened was that after I tried to commit suicide when I was 14, after the um, the, the guy that laced us was, um, shot and killed um the therapist had a session with my brother and my dad because i had told her of course about my brother and um i saw, first told about the rape, and my brother stood up and said oh i'm gonna go kick his butt 
And I looked at him and I said, why are you getting so mad about the situation when you did worse than that? You did it for four and a half years. He was like, oh, you're just getting it mixed up with the ripe. It's all in your head, you know. I only did it one time and it was childhood curiosity. Well, he said that because my aunt caught him the first time and she had just prayed and thought it was childhood curiosity, you know. So uh, when she did that, I thought, I'm not supposed to tell anybody, you know, this is just something that happens as part of life. So um, then my dad kind of believed my brother in the, the meeting. My brother left the room. And the therapist told him, you know, she's not making this up. It's not in her head. This actually happened. This has a lot to do with her mental state. But my father couldn't really absorb the idea that his son was doing that to his daughter. You know, it was, I don't know if it was embarrassment or what, but he was in denial about the situation. So it kind of put a big gap in our relationship after that. And him not believing me was a very tough circumstance. I, I couldn't stand the fact that my father couldn't believe what had happened to me. And I wanted out of the house so badly. I, I just, I wanted out. So not only being physically abused, but emotionally abused over and over again and not having that emotional support with your dad for that. Am I understanding that correctly? You are, and he never even told my stepmother what happened. And I thought he had, and that she didn't believe me too. So, you know, not I thought not only do I not have my father's support, but I don't have her support either. So I just stayed, you know, kind of secluded to my room. I just try to stay away from them you know, until it was time to eat or we had to go to church or something like that, you know. I The emotional scars must have ran so deep. Now, not having your father's support, your stepmother's support. When did you decide to move out of, out of the house? Like, what was that? Well, after the rape and all um, that happened, I did get a really good boyfriend. He was really good to me. He never pursued me or anything like that. But I thought he was too good for me, so I broke up with him. I thought I didn't deserve that because all I had known was pain. And that wasn't normal to me, that the goodness. So I later um, connected with another guy and ended up pregnant at 16. And after I had my daughter and I was a senior in high school, um, I moved out and moved in with his family and him. So at 17, I moved out of the house. At 17. A lot to go through, a lot of emotional baggage to go through for quite a few years and now your mom at 17 yeah and it didn't it, stop it there it didn't stop there i hate to ask this question was the next thing that happened just as bad um well for 11 years I stayed with my husband and we had two more children and he was physically abusive as well um there was times that I had to go to the hospital and have stitches um I had black black eyes or you know I, I, I was you could tell I was being physically abused, but I, of course, denied it, made excuses, and things like that. After 11 years, we finally, um, I finally left him. Or actually, he left me, because during all that 
others have used it for years. I, was, I got on my knees a lot of times and I prayed to God. I was like, God, you know, Wes was really good to me. The boyfriend that I had that was good that I, you know, broke up with. I said, I should have never let him go. Um, please just bring him back to me. I want that happiness again. And he did. He sent Wes back to me. And Wes helped me get out of that situation. He helped me get into a three-bedroom apartment with my children. And one day I went to work and I came home and he was gone. And I was like, God, why did you send him away? He was good. I asked you to bring him back into my life. And he said, I did, Daisy. I brought him back. He got you out of a situation that you would have never gotten out of otherwise. He did his, he served his purpose. So he wasn't needed anymore. We got out of that situation. So he was still, God was still there for me. You know, he was still answering my prayers. Throughout the years of abuse, I just wasn't looking and noticing those signs, you know. But I will say that at 14, he did tell me one day, I rededicated my life. And he said, you're going to have a story to share with the world. And I said, I don't have a testimony. He said, no, but one of these days you're going to. Your path was always, I believe, meant to be predetermined in such a way because I feel that this is one of those stories I'm hearing what you're saying I'm listening I'm obviously reading your book and I am still blown away at everything you've been through we're up up to your life at that point this man Wes comes back in your life and now he's not in your life anymore what happened with Wes um unfortunately Wes died in 2008 so oh I'm so sorry yeah and I hadn't seen him when we did reconnect it was 2000 and I hadn't seen him in 20 years and uh how my husband and I left was, or, or split up was, I was on the computer playing Slingo and Wes had contacted me through classmates.com. And I was just sharing with him what had happened to my dad and things like that. Um, you know, just catching up with each other. And my husband knew that that's my ex-boyfriend. He called his girlfriend that he had had behind my back and said, She's on the computer talking to her boyfriend, come and get me. So that was his out, really. That was that was what he needed to, to leave. But Wes came on down, picked me up, and got me out of that house. Thank God. Yeah, because even though my husband had left, he had come back and, and, would, and, and beat me one night. I had to leave and go get the neighbor because I didn't. He broke my telephone. I was trying to call the police. And... So yeah, Wes, like it's best that you don't stay here because he's ha he has access to this house. We've got to get you out of here. So we did. Wow. Daisy, do you think that women that are in those situations, what are some things that friends and family can do to help their loved ones in this situation based on what you've been through? First thing I suggest is, you know, pray about it. Pray that God sends you someone that can help you, that you know you can trust to help you get out of that situation. If need be, and you have access, call 911. But that person can be your confidant and you can share what's going on with them let them know you know and make a plan on getting out when that person is not home or you know they're not going to be home you know make a plan and and get what you need and get out of there you can get the police and go back and get what you need later but 
that's that's the thing I suggest is make sure make you know tell God to send you that confidant, the person that you, is going to be your help helper, your savior to get you out of that predicament. And there's always domestic violence centers that you can call, and they will help you. And they will put you up in a shelter. They will even help you get housing. There's victims advocacy that will help you as well. Wow. Because yeah. um, go, I'm sorry, go ahead. Well, I don't know if you want me to go that far yet, so I'll wait. Okay. Um, so now you're in this apartment with your three children. What happens with your life after Wes leaves? It was getting close to Christmas time. I'm making eight dollars and fifty cents an hour, raising three kids, trying to pay all the bills. Can't even do that. And I'm like, how am I supposed to provide for for them for Christmas? You know, I know God. They know what Christmas is all about. For for me, I want to see the joy on their faces. You know? mm-hmm. So, a couple of days after that prayer, there was a knock at the door. And by the time I got to the door, there was, there was no one there, but there was a bicycle and like three big garbage bags just full of clothes and toys and all sorts of things for the kids. Oh and I my thought, gosh! Thought God, thank you for providing for me. But that wasn't it. A couple of days later, there was another knock at the door. But I, this time I got to it. There was a lady with another bicycle and a couple more bags. And I'm like, did you break something the other day? She's like, no, just these things were, that, which were donated to the church from an anonymous donor for you. So I was like, God, thank you so much. I, I took the presents over to my best friend's house that lived next door and hid them, you know, and um, Eugene, my husband now, he was my friend. I've known him since kindergarten. He came over to my apartment on Christmas Eve, and I said, "Will you help me get these gifts and bring them over for, so I can set them up for the kids?" And he said, "Of course." So um, we did that. I even had stuff to put away for their birthdays. You know, there was so much stuff. It was just awesome, and it was the it was even a better Christmas than I've ever given them with my husband. So. It was so awesome for them to come out and of their bedrooms that morning and see everything, you know, all the gifts and everything put together that was from Santa Claus, you know. Oh, my heart, seeing them with the joys on their faces. It was just amazing. And I thanked God so much for that because there was no way. I wasn't even going to be able to get them anything, even the dollar store stuff, you know. I couldn't have done it. I knew, you know, God's still with me. That showed me there. He's going to help me. He's not going to, he has not left me. He is always there for me. And God is a common factor in your life through all your stories, even the bad stories. Yeah. And Are you still there? Yeah, I'm here. Can you hear me okay? Are you, do, are you there? I'm here. I'm here. You froze up a little on your end. Can you hear me okay? Okay. It looks like we're having some technical difficulties. Let's see if we can refresh here. Daisy was just explaining her Christmas and the many benefactors who came to her home and gave her gifts for her children and how amazing is that oh my gosh daisy if you can hear me try refreshing your page i don't know what happened yeah that was that that was that was god playing a trick on us i swear to god (laughs) um But everyone on Wisdom, we have many listeners on Wisdom. Um, Daisy is back. So Christmas time, oh my gosh, Eugene helped you. 
And now you get to see the wonderful expressions on your children's faces that morning. And there, there's nothing better than seeing your children's faces light up on Christmas morning. Oh, I know. It's the best present ever. <laughs> I, I can understand that one. So Eugene is in your life. Friends since kindergarten. When did you all get married? Well, um, at this time, we went to the store, he, you know, at, during this Christmas break after my kids went to go see their dad for the part of Christmas. Um, he took me to the grocery store, and I've known his mom all my life, too, and so she was in front of us in, in line. She looked at the cashier, and she says, don't they make such a cute couple? And I said, Trish, we're not a couple, and she goes, I said, we're just friends. She said, but you know what? One of these days you will be because mom's no best. So 10 years, well, he had asked me out actually at that time and I turned him down because in high school, I asked him to the Sadie Hawkins dance and he turned me down. So I said, no, you had your chance. You turned me down. So no, nope, I'm going to turn you down now. <laughs> oh my goodness. But he, he still courted you. He did. So 2000. And do we want to get into that part first? Sure. Um, after the Christmas break, I wanted a change for my children. And I joined the army. So I could take them away from this place and start a new life travel or whatever we needed to do with the army but I got hurt basic training I hurt my knee and so I had I got discharged but I was in physical therapy and uh, there was this man in physical therapy as well for his neck and we just got to talking and about spirituality and Christianity and you know things we were really connected like instantly you know so he lived in upstate New York and I'd always wanted to visit upstate New York so I got released before he did and I gave him my number and when he got out he called me and said he was home and a couple well maybe about a month or so later I went up there to visit and I loved it so much I was up there for two weeks and it was like two maybe the one night before I left or so, you know, he said, you know, things are going really well for us. He had not pursued me in any way while I was up there visiting. He said, I would really like to be a couple. And the kids keep, they kept teasing, daddy's got a girlfriend, daddy's got a girlfriend, you know. And his kids and my kids had talked on the phone and they were like, oh, Kim, I want to meet you, I want to meet you, you know, so. Um. I said, okay, you know, I love it up here. It's really pretty. It's went home. We got my children and my stuff, and we came back. And four and a half years I was up there. Everything was going great. I had a good job. He never laid a finger on me. And then one night he snapped over some dogs of all things. It was like a switch. And hit me over the head with a ceramic bowl and fractured my skull. I fought unconsciousness until I had met a, a friend up there. She became my best friend. So I fought unconsciousness until she arrived. And once she got there, I knew my kids were going to be okay. I just lost consciousness. And two, two days later, I woke up to her in my hospital room asked her, you know, how long have I been asleep? She said, two, two days. You've got a fractured skull. You're leaking cerebellum fluid from your brain. Um, no telling how long you're going to be here. And I'm like, well, where are my kids? You know, that's what I say I thought of. She said, they're fine. They're with the pastor and his family. So I was like, okay, that's good. That's good. I know that, that Doug can't hurt them. You know, he's with, mm -hmm. some, with some good people. Uh, or there was some good people. And then I got out 
and the charge flew my younger two kids home. Then the, now the assault happened in October. His mother bailed him out the same night, so he was out. I had to get victimless advocacy to help me, you know, arrange to get my things and my older daughter and I home. So I was up there. I got out of the hospital mid middle of November, I think it was. Got my kids home, my two year one time before Thanksgiving. But so I was looking over my shoulder and I developed PTSD, of course, you know, after everything I've been through. But um, I never saw him thank, thank God, you know, I know he was, that was, that was God again, protecting me. Um, so it was the first of December before I got to go home. So, you know, almost two months later before I got to go back, come back to Texas. And um, the a victim's advocacy flew someone up from Texas to drive me and my older daughter in a U-Haul at my car home. And Eugene came over and helped me unload my U-Haul and asked me to go to the movies. I said, well, third time, well, I'll take you up on it, you know. So I went to the movies with him and we mutually actually kissed that night. What? Here we, are. Here we are. We've been together ever since. We've been married for 12 years. Oh and my God. Been together since 2008 now. So he sounds like a wonderful man. And I just want to describe for our listeners on the Wisdom app that are um, listening to the podcast Daisy's face lit up like a Christmas tree and she's got shitty ass grin on her face and it's just absolutely adorable and um that he sounds like a wonderful man obviously oh he is he you know since I'm diagnosed with MSA multi-system atrophy I can't do any of my basic necessities tasks you know like bathing br brushing my hair brushing my teeth um, cutting up my food I, I can barely hardly pick up the fork to eat but I managed to do that go to the bathroom you know by myself things like that he does all that for me he I am 100% reliable on him and he is absolutely wonderful, absolutely wonderful. I couldn't do it without him. And I know that if I would have been with anybody else, they would have left me a long time ago throughout this. You know, they wouldn't be there for me like Eugene. He, he had to quit his job last September because I got to the point where I just kept falling, and falling, and falling. So he's been taking care of me now for um, every day for almost a year. Wow. That is amazing. And as a caregiver, as, as a spouse, it must be obviously very hard for him. And I want to back up just a little bit. Um, I noticed, for instance, today, you're obviously lighting up like a Christmas tree, but part of M, M as in Mary, S as in Sam, A as in Apple, and it's hard for me to say those words, muscle, multi, multi system atrophy, multi system atrophy. Yeah, there's two types of it, but it is so rare that only four people out of every 100,000 people in the U.S. are diagnosed with it. So I unfortunately got one of those unlucky cards, but I believe that everything in the past that I've gone through has given me strength through God. I wouldn't you know, have the strength I do if, I, if it wasn't for God. Through the faith that I had in him, um, he made me strong enough to be able to deal with this because it is it's very difficult. It's very painful. And it is a quickly progressing disorder, obviously. It took them two years to diagnose me because at first they, they diagnosed me with Parkinson's. So there's two types. There's the MSAP, which is in Parkinsonism. And then there's an MSAC, which is cerebellum. Um, 
in in my book i do have a section called what is msa and i and i describe it because it is so rare and that's one of my goals also is to bring awareness to this disorder um, and 10 percent of all of my book proceeds go to charity to help research for a cure for this disorder but um the one that I have, like I said, it starts off with like Parkinsonism, where you fall, you're, you know, you're, you're, you lose your coordination. Mm -hmm. And why it's called multi-system atrophy is because all your autonomic systems, the systems that you don't have to think about, like your breathing, your circulatory system, your digestive systems, all those kinds of systems, they start shutting down. And mm. So I am having issues with, with already with my urinary system, and my digestive system, and my circulatory system, where if I stand up, my blood pressure will drop and I'll pass out. Um, I know at the doctor, they make you take it laying down and then your blood pressure and then sitting up and then standing up. It'll get as low as 60 over 52. Whoa, that's sometimes, wicked long. Yeah, and sometimes they can't even find a blood pressure. They're like, it's non-existent. Sit down. Oh, my Lord. Oh, my goodness. And I noticed today versus when we met a couple of weeks ago, your speaking seems a little bit labored. Is MSA, I would assume that it has something to do with that. It does. It does affect your speech. I had just taken my medicine a little bit before I came on, and that does help with the speech. It does get worse in the evening. The tired, when I get tired, it gets harder to talk and, of course, harder to do anything. So. Oh, my gosh. Now, when you received the diagnosis, as you said, that they diagnosed you with Parkinson's and then they, the day that you found out that it was this very rare MSAC. C. C as in cat, correct? No, I have P, not Paul. Oh, okay. P. Okay. Let's see, I must have understood that. Okay. The, the day that you found out that it was MSA, and you realize that it was a terminal prognosis. That was one of the hardest days of my life. Um, my, my stepmother is still in my life because she was my mom. She raised me and she's a nurse. So she goes to all my doctor's appointments because you know, of COVID, only one person can go with you. And so it's out of town. Um, we had rented this little cabin in the town where the doctor was. And my husband and the dog stayed at the cabin while she took me to the doctor and I got the diagnosis. But we were there for almost four hours. And, um, he, you know, I called him. He goes, what, what's going on? I said, well, it's not Parkinson. So well, what is it? And I, said it's MSA he said what is that and I said multi-system atrophy I said well, I'll go to the pharmacy get some lab work done and I'll be, be there to pick you up we'll be there to pick you all up well when the doctor told me that I had MSA I said well will I get better he said no there is no cure it's so rare there's there's no cure and it didn't really hit me until I saw my husband. When I when we got to the cabin, he came running out to the car and he's his hair was all frazzled and he's pale as a ghost. And he's like not saying anything and I was like, What is wrong? He goes, What is wrong? And I'm like, What is wrong? I thought it was upset because we were gone for so long and so did my mom. She said, well, We're sorry it took so long. We didn't expect that. And he's like, That's not what I'm upset about and it's like I'm like what is wrong he goes you you only have five to seven years to live and i'm like what 
he just broke down on the ground and started crying and that's when it you know hit me because seeing him in that state my mom got out of the car she went over there and she said eugene you know she was trying to try to pick him up she goes we don't know they're going to find a cure between now and then they have to do research there's clinical trials there's all kinds of things that can happen all we can do is pray and he's like pray there is no God. He keeps doing all these bad things, you know. He's just, I prayed for my mom to to um, be healed, and she died. And I said, honey, she did get healed. She had cancer. She was suffering. He healed her, but not the way you wanted. He healed her by giving her eternal life. She's not in pain anymore. And he's like, but now you, your condition, you know. All the way home, I couldn't still fathom it, you know, because he was mm -hmm. in the back seat kind of laying down, still just in shock. He was like, taking, it, taking it so hard that all I could do was focus on him, you know, and then finally I started doing some research on it. It, it got um, a little harder for me. Um, my, da my daughter's one of my caretakers. She comes over two days a week and helps my husband out. Um, so we started going through pictures and dividing things up, dividing some of my real mother's things up between all the kids, some of my dad's things because he's passed away, you know, so he was possibly murdered. So that's another story. But, um, you know, then it, I did my direct, direct um, advanced directive for no, no, no DNR, power of attorney, uh, reassign my rights to my book. You know, I'm, trying, I'm, not, I'm getting everything in line, my ducks in a row, so to speak, because I know that God had told me I didn't have much time here, but I had to tell my story first. So my work that I have left to do is to share my story so I can inspire others to keep the faith. And he's he's been showing me, you know, glimpses of heaven. And every time I see one of those glimpses, I get more and more at peace where I know where I'm going. And I can't wait to get there. I know I'm going to be leaving some loved ones behind. But I know they're going to have each other. And they're going to have their the counseling they need. I have an amazing counselor, by the way. Um, she's been counseling me for five years. And every time i would get to a difficult part in my book it would be a time for a session with her so i know that god lined that up for me you know because he knew it was going to be therapeutic for me at the same time as difficult and it was but i tell you what janice after writing this book i'm seeing things unfold like my brother just got indicted for sexual misconduct of a youth group because he's a youth minister of all things. Um, oh, Lordy. Before that, he molested his stepdaughter and her daughter. So God's, you know, I, I, I forgave everybody that harmed me, by the way, because I truly believe that you have to forgive in order to be forgiven. And God said, vengeance is his. So I put all that into his hands and he's going to take care of that for me. Daisy, how long has it been since that fateful day when you witnessed your husband, your husband's reaction to your terminal condition? Last July 16th to 2021. So just a little over a year ago, about two weeks, more than a year ago. And you wrote your book, which again, as you said, was therapeutic and having your, uh, your counselor, your guide there with you to help you through those really tough parts of that, of your story that must have been incredibly difficult to put on paper and now you're in the process of writing a second book can you 
tell us do you have and she's girding from ear to ear again this is a great sign do you have a name for that book yet i do would you like to share it or you want to hold off on that beyond the gates of heaven oh my gosh that is so beautiful beyond the gates of heaven yes when do you it's a short story and I'm actually on the last chapter. So I'm hoping to have it out within the next three to four months. Wow. My daughter um, actually designed the cover of Unexpected Moments. And That's beautiful. She's working on the cover of Beyond the Gates of Heaven for me. And what a special meaning that has, because now that I'm looking at the cover on your pedestal behind you, I see more depth and meaning of the name of your book. Yeah. Unexpected moments. And out of all those unexpected moments came so many bright and wonderful gifts that were given to you. And as I mentioned at the beginning of this, your the foreword for Unexpected Moments was written by Kurt Cameron. That must have been so amazing to connect with him on such a spiritual level. It was. And for him, I know you've read the foreword, so you know what I'm saying. I, he says I inspired him. And... I'm like, what? I inspired Kurt Cameron. He's the one that inspired me to write this book. But, you know, me, like, along with probably millions of girls my age, or so in the 80s or 90s, he was my celebrity heartthrob. I had his posters all over my walls. and uh, Oh, um, so there was an ulterior motive to that evening you were telling me about when your husband was going to take you to a concert. But you ended up at this um, get together where Kurt Cameron is. So, and she's still grinning from ear to ear. <laughs> yeah, we were, we were actually supposed to go to Vermont to see my best friend there, the one that helped me when my when I was assaulted. But she had COVID, so we couldn't go. And we were driving down um, the street, and we on the mar marquee of the big church in our town, it said Kurt Cameron was coming, and he said, "Well." Since you can't go to Vermont and see your friend, do you want to go see Kurt Cameron? I said, do I? Of course, you know. <laughs> of course. Now, did he know about this? Oh, Little yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's why he said, do you want to go see him instead? So I was like, yeah, you know, I've always wanted to meet him. So um, I was a VIP guest at Kurt Cameron's, and I'm in a wheelchair, of course, so. My mom took me and she's a nurse. She didn't have time to change before she took me to the event. So she's a nurse, scrubs, pushing me around in my wheelchair. Probably look like I got a private nurse, you know, but mm -hmm. I'm in the front row and it's question and answer time. So I raised my hand and I got nervous and I put it down. And this guy raises his hand in the middle of the aisle and he says, yes, sir. The guy says, the lady down there on the end has a question for you. And I'm like, oh, geez, put me on the spot. Why don't you? Kirk says, well, yes, ma'am. I said, first I said, do y'all plan on having another Seavers reunion? The Growing Pains family. Mm -hmm. He said, well, you know, Alan Thick passed away, but Joanna Kearns, Tracy Gold, and Jeremy Miller and I, we've all kind of been discussing it. And I was like, oh, that would be so awesome. I said, now I just want you to know that I was a big fan of yours when you were on Growing Pains, and I had your posters all over my walls, and I wrote you a letter and asked you for an autographed picture, and I gave you three months, and you did not send me a letter. I tore your posters down off my walls. I was so heartbroken. He said, oh, my goodness. Well, how about I make that up to you tonight? And I said, that would be awesome. Well, then it became picture time where you get to have your pictures taken with him. And I was just going to wait till everybody had their turn and see if he would come off the stage and take his with me since I'm in the wheelchair. And these men came over to me. One of them was the one that raised his hand and he said, 
would you like us to put your wheelchair on the stage? I was like, you don't have to do that. And they said, well, we want to. So they picked me up, put me on stage, and even in front of them in line. So when I got up to Kirk, I gave him an MSA bracelet. And I said, this is what I have. It was a DFEMSA.org bracelet. And it's terminal. And I said, I don't want to take my picture with you in your, my wheelchair. I said, can you help me out of it so I can stand next to you and, and take one? He said, of course. Can you get up? And I said, yeah, if you help me. So he helps me out. Well, I had the death grip on him, you know. And um, you can see I'm just starstruck and just, like you said, glowing and smiling ear to ear. Looking well, like a goofy old teenager, you know. <laughs> And then after the event, after the event inside the church, they have campfires outside and do a little bit more singing and worshiping. So I went out there and um, I told the security guard, I said, I'd like for him to sign my um, ticket. He said, okay, I'll get him for you. And he came over and he said, multi-system atrophy, huh? And I said, yeah, and he, it's terminal. There's no cure. I said, no. Can I pray for you? He asked me. And I said, of course you can. He knelt down beside my wheelchair and grabbed both my hands, said a beautiful prayer for me. And I told him what God had told me about sharing my story. He said, well, how do you plan to do that? And I said, I don't know. He said, why don't you write a book? I said, and that's what I said earlier. I've never written a book. Mm -hmm. I just kept him updated. Okay, uh, he gave me his email address to so keep him updated. So I would send him emails every now and then and say, okay, I'm on chapter 20 or 23 or whatever. He's like, good job. You're moving quite a quickly along. I said, well, I pray every day, God, give me the words to write today. And he, and the words would just flow. By the way, I met Kirk in October, and the very next day I started writing. January 23rd, I was completely finished writing. I devoted about three or four hours a day to writing. My husband and I, we proofread it before we sent it to Kirk Cameron because he asked me to send him the manuscript. Sent it to him. Within a week, he had to make a trip to Tennessee and back, so he read it on the plane. And then when he got back, he sent me that forward. And I would like to read it too, if you don't mind, because it's beautiful, I, isn't it? I It is. I would absolutely love for you to read it. Because I've read some other forwards that he's done for people, and they're like a couple sentences. But Janice is not a couple of sentences. No, it is not. <laughs> <laughs> made me feel so special and he definitely made up for not sending me that autograph and I would say so when I was a teen okay so it was an autumn night in Texas when I first met Daisy she came up to me in a wheelchair uh, came up in a wheelchair next to me in the, at the campfire her smile was bright she shared her journey with me and told me she did not have much time left on earth I told her to write down her story and I would do anything I can to help share her story with the world. I only spoke with her briefly that night, but her attitude and resilient spirit inspired me. I hope this book of an individual's incredible journey through emotional, physical, and spiritual pain and coming through the other side of tragedy, still praising the Lord, will encourage you in your present situation. Daisy's message will bring you comfort and remind you you are not alone in your struggles or life circumstances. I pray her words bring you hope. There is one who knows the plans he has for you, plans to give you hope in a future. Jeremiah 29 11, Kirk Cameron. Special indeed. Made up for the, the letter that never arrived to you. Daisy, I want to take this opportunity to tell you I am humbled being in your presence. Your message, your story is very powerful. 
Thanks. And throughout the description, you're so welcome. Throughout the description of your journey, you, you always mention God, but you didn't mention him. You felt him. He lives through you. Yeah. Writing a book, unexpected moments, the things that have happened that should not have happened, but they've shaped your life in such a way that you're able to share it with others in a way that honors your journey. I can't thank you enough for being here today, for sharing your vulnerable, raw story. And <laughs> excuse me, I just want to let everyone know that unexpected moments, part of the profits proceeds do go to the research. So please keep that in mind. These are the stories that inspire us, Daisy. Your story will elevate people to a different area and bring back to them what maybe they thought they have lost. You are a beautiful, bright soul here with us now. And I know that you have left an indelible impression with me again i want to thank you so much for being so vulnerable in sharing your story daisy i know that you're on social media and i will make sure that all of your information and i believe you're even on tiktok is that correct Yes, barely though. I'm more, more okay. Instagram. Instagram. Okay. Well, I'll make sure all that information gets in there. I want to thank you all, <laughs> excuse me, for being here today. These are the stories that inspired us. Let Daisy's message of hope, resiliency, and living through Christ, going to God who has been with her throughout her whole life and will continue to be with her. My name is Janice, the host of Stories That Inspire Us. Today, I was inspired, continue to be inspired by Daisy. I love you to pieces. And I hope you will keep us up to date with your second book and when it comes out, because these are truly the stories that inspire us. Thank you so much, everyone, for being here today. Daisy, thank you. You're very welcome. Thank you for having me. You're so welcome. And folks, we'll see you again real soon. Let me know what you thought of today's podcast. You can always go to my website and leave us a voice message, and I will make sure that that gets to Daisy. Thank you so much, everyone, and we'll see you again real soon.